It is finally October. I've been looking forward to this for several months now. This year for October, we're diving deep into my favorite horror franchise of all time, Halloween. This is The Shape of Fear, and we're starting it off with a bang as we rank the entire Halloween franchise on this episode of Ranking Rumble. Purely and simply evil. Welcome back to WWH. My name is Andrew Dreamer. October is my favorite month of the year, and that's not just because my birthday is this month. I love all things Halloween and spooky. As I said, this month we're focusing on the Halloween franchise, and I'm calling it The Shape of Fear. Halloween is my favorite movie of all time. John Carpenter's original is almost single-handedly responsible for my love of the horror genre. Some of my earliest memories involved me watching it with my sister. Granted, I was probably a little too young, but hey, I think I turned out all right. Now, I did rank this franchise once before right after Halloween Ends came out, but that's been two whole years now. Have my thoughts and feelings changed? Frankly, they have. And to be honest, they'll probably change again, but that's okay. Now, before we get going, I want to know what the good memories that you have with the franchise or even just the original film are. So go ahead and put those down in the comments section below and let's all just reminisce. And one more thing. I know how passionate Halloween fans can be. We all like different things for different reasons and there's nothing wrong with that. This is just my opinion. Doesn't have to match your ranking. It's okay to disagree, but we can be respectful about it. On that note, it is just about bell time, so grab your popcorn and make your way to your seat. Let's head down to the ring and officially get the Shape of Fear underway. Starting us off at lucky number 13 is Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Yep, still bottom of the barrel for me. Look, I've tried. I've tried to give this movie a chance. I just can't. This is not what I want from a Halloween movie at all. Not in the slightest. It honestly just infuriates me, almost to the point where I don't even know where to start. Um, all right, so I think Rob Zombie's a good director. I like the way he frames things. I think he has a lot of talent in that area, but where he falls short, in my opinion, is in his writing. I'm not a fan of his dialogue or the way he writes his characters, to be perfectly honest with you. They're all just the most trashy versions of people. Almost every character has the same personality. But enough of that. Let's focus on this particular movie. Not a fan of the whole white horse storyline. Despise what Dr. Loomis is in this movie. He's a deplorable human who exploits tragedy for profit. And whatever moral code he had in the first film is completely non-existent. I won't say there's nothing redeemable about this movie, though. I like the brutality and the gore. Tyler Mayne does give a very strong performance as Michael. He's an imposing figure, but I did not need nor want to hear Michael yell die at the end of the movie. I also think that it's interesting the way Laurie is portrayed. She's broken mentally and understandably so. I mean, who would it be? But overall, I honestly just have no interest in watching this movie ever again. Look, this movie is very divisive. Some people love it, some people hate it. I just fall in the camp that hates it. But we do have a lot to cover on this show, so let's keep it rolling. Coming in at number 12 is Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. The only reason this movie isn't last is because I at least have a bit of nostalgia for it. Growing up, I spent my Halloweens marathoning this franchise on TV, and this film was a part of that. Last time I ranked this franchise, I think I had it a couple spots higher, but my feelings have changed. This movie is utter shit. Sorry, just need a minute. Okay, I blame this dumpster fire mostly on the director. Dominique Othen and Gerard, he changed so much just because he felt like it. Because he made a choice. Well, jackass, your choices were a giant slap in the face to all of the fans and everything that came before. The Myers house, what is that? That's not the Myers house. 
This is the Myers house. Oh, and you remember Rachel, our capable and smart and protective final girl from Halloween 4? Yeah, she's killed off 21 minutes into the movie. And why? Because Dominique Odin and Gerard made a choice. He didn't want a blonde lead. He wanted a lead with dark hair, so we ended up with Tina, one of the most insufferable characters in film history. She's loud, annoying, and we're expected to care about her and her relationship with Jamie. Well, I don't. Not saying it would have been perfect, but swapping Rachel and Tina in this movie would have made a world of difference. Like I said, though, it wouldn't have been perfect. You still have the dumb cops with the ridiculous clown noises. You'd still have full-on Looney Loomis. Yeah, Loomis is almost as much of a villain as Michael in this movie. And that's not a good thing. He has become so obsessed with killing Michael to the point of straight up using Jamie as bait, putting her life at risk. Like, what are you doing, dude? Loomis from the original film would never, ever do this. I blame Odin and Gerard for this too. Next up at number 11 is Rob Zombie's Halloween. Basically everything I said about his version of the second movie can be copied and pasted here. Other than the plot points, of course. So we all know the basic three act structure of a movie. Well, Rob Zombie's Halloween is probably the movie that makes the separation of those acts the most obvious. It almost feels amateur in a way. And again, that comes down to the writing. The first act, which is by far the worst, is all backstory. We see what makes Michael tick. We see how his upbringing and his environment turned him into the monster that we all know. I don't need to see all of this. I don't want to know why Michael is the way he is, especially in this white trash abusive way. Then we get to the second act where Michael is at Smith's Grove with Dr. Loomis. Now, this could have been really interesting, but I don't think they really did anything with it. It almost is just padding for the runtime. Had they shortened the beginning and expanded this section of the movie, I think I would have enjoyed it a little bit more. And the third act is just a condensed version of John Carpenter's original, with some very heightened violence, which again, I don't mind. I don't hate this part of the movie, but it's the sum of all its parts that makes me not like it. At number 10, we have Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, or Halloween 6. This film was facing a major uphill battle just going into it. After the mess that was Halloween 5, there was just so much to explain and clean up. Perhaps the biggest mess was the whole man in black thing. There was no plan when this character was introduced. It was just an idea that got thrown in and then left for whoever came in next. And well, what we got is a cult controlling Michael and using him to do their bidding. I won't pretend that it doesn't shatter any mystery that still remained with Michael or that it's even a logical storyline. But there are some redeemable qualities here. I quite enjoy Paul Rudd's performance as Tommy Doyle. It's clear that he's a new actor, sure, but there's some charm behind it. And I've always loved the scene where he's trying to get Kara out of the room and he does this little twitch when he sees Michael coming. I don't know why, but it has always stuck with me. I also think the mask in this movie is pretty good much better than the last couple and some that come after it. The kills are also really good. The John Strode kill from the theatrical version is actually one of my favorite kills from the entire franchise. But coming in at number nine is Halloween Resurrection. This movie was near the bottom the last time I ranked the franchise. But since then, I've learned to just turn my brain off and enjoy this for what it is. Is it a bad movie? Yeah, it is. Does it ruin the great ending of H2O? Yeah, it does. But I actually think this movie is kind of fun. Really, really dumb, illogical, ridiculous fun, sure, but fun nonetheless. It's Michael killing people for an hour and a half. One of the issues, though, is the opening. Laurie is killed not even 20 minutes into the movie, and that was because Jamie Lee Curtis was just plain fed up. They ruined the ending of H2O and kind of pulled a fast one on her in the process, so she demanded that her character be killed off. Completely understandable. And that's not even my issue, really. My issue is that the opening 20 minutes of the film feels like a totally separate movie from the rest of it. There's no connective tissue. Then there's Busta Rhymes. Look, I don't blame him. He looks like he was having the time of his life, but I just can't get behind the kung fu making Michael look stupid thing. I'm just not a fan, but I can laugh at it. And that's how I feel about a majority of this movie. It's stupid, but I can have a stupid good time with it. 
Next up at number eight, we have Halloween Ends. Yeah, this one has dropped a few spots on my list, but it's not for the reason you may think. It's not because Michael isn't featured a ton in the movie. It's because the storyline just feels like it came out of nowhere. And, well, it kind of did. Why are we focusing on Corey, a character we never met before in a movie that's the closing chapter of a trilogy? I like that they swung for the fences. They went way outside the box with the parallels to Christine. I think that's really interesting. But I wish they would have introduced Corey in the previous film so that he didn't just feel like a rando thrown into all of this. Most of the other stuff I enjoy. I like the tone. I like the brutality. I like the final fight with Michael and Lori. And I really like that sense of finality that comes with the ending. I understand a lot of hate that this movie gets, but I do think some of it's a bit unnecessary. It's divisive, no doubt, but there's a lot of good stuff here. I also believe that it being higher on my list last time has to do with recency bias, which tends to happen sometimes when you get a new entry in a major franchise. Our number seven entrant is Halloween 2 from 1981. I just want to say from this point forward, I absolutely adore all of these movies. So Halloween 2 picks up right after the events of the original film with a slight alteration to the number of times Michael was shot, but that's really just a continuity thing. Not really that big of a deal. But I do like how well it flows from the first film to this one. It's very easy to watch them both back to back. I think that it would even be cool to cut both of them together to make one big movie. And I'm sure somebody's actually done that already, but I'd like to see it if anybody has it. They also amped up the violence and gore a bit, which was a John Carpenter decision. And from that, we get some really iconic death scenes, such as the nurse being lifted up by the scalpel and then her shoes falling off, or the syringe in the head, or the therapy tub. This movie is filled with so many cool moments that are just ingrained in, into my memory. Let's just try to ignore that terrible wig that Jamie Lee Curtis was wearing the whole time and move on. Coming in at number six is Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. That's right, the one without Michael Myers, although he does briefly appear on TV as the original film is playing. I am so happy that this movie finally started getting its flowers. It, it did take a while, but people finally came around. This is just a really good movie. I just think the timing was off and the marketing was off. I understand what John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were going for and what they wanted to accomplish, but I just, I love the story of this movie. You have a crazy dude named Connell Cochran who owns Silver Shamrock Masks, and somehow he's using the power of Stonehenge to make these masks kill people. Then you have these robots running around too, and the twist with Ellie towards the end. It all leads to what I consider to be one of the best endings ever. We don't know if Dr. Chalice was able to get the last channel to stop the broadcast. Look, this movie is absolutely insane, but it is so damn good and very well written. Tommy Lee Wallace also did a phenomenal job with the direction. Number five in this ranking rumble is Halloween 2018. When it first came out, I probably would have said that this is the best Halloween sequel of all time. Now, my feelings have cooled off a little bit, but it's still so good. They brought back Laurie Strode to face her monster once more. Well, technically thrice more, but you get the point. She's become a paranoid, obsessive woman who has lost her daughter, barely has a relationship with her granddaughter, and it's all in preparation for the return of Michael Myers. She's convinced that he will come for her, and in a way, he does. I love what James Jude Courtney brings to the role of Michael Myers. He actually is probably my favorite Michael. I love the brutality this version of Michael brings to the table, but... I do have an issue here. I despise the twist with Dr. Sartain. I think it's pointless and stupid, and I'm actually glad that it ends up really not going anywhere. In fact, the only thing it does is bring Michael to Lori to set up that amazing third act of the film, and it really is amazing. Next up at number four, we have Halloween H2O. Despite the confusing and ridiculous title, despite the masks, and yes, I do mean masks, I find myself coming back to this movie more often than most of the others. It just has so much rewatchability for me. I love the way Laurie is portrayed here. She's hidden from Michael for 20 years and he finally finds her. She snaps right out of that fear and jumps into action to protect her son from Michael. I actually do prefer this version of Laurie over the version we got in 2018. 
I'm also a big fan of Josh Hartnett. So that plays into it as well for me. I've always been a fan of his and I'm happy that he's finally getting some bigger roles now. But there is something that we have to talk about. I mentioned it just a minute ago, the masks. They used a few different masks in the film and the only good one was the one moment that we get to see that mask from Halloween 6. And then there's that damn CGI mask. It just looks so bad. I would just love to edit that shot out of the movie. But overall, I really, really do like this movie a lot. Our number three entrant is going to be Halloween Kills. I know that there is a lot of hate for this movie. Basically, everything involving the hospital is the reason that you usually hear. And you know what? That's fine. I, I get it. Lori's in a hospital bed for the whole movie, basically. But to me, it does make sense. She's been stabbed and attacked. I mean, she's not Superwoman. Then there's the other mental patient who everybody thinks is Michael. I do think it's pretty dumb that everybody thought this Danny DeVito looking dude was Michael. It really makes no sense, but I can look past that because I absolutely love how brutal this movie is. It has more kills than any other Halloween movie by a long shot. I mean, the gore is fantastic. The kills themselves are great. I mean, the movie definitely lives up to its name. I honestly wish Rob Zombie's movies were more like this, from the tone to the pace to the atmosphere. I think it would have helped a lot, at least in my opinion. Oh, and this movie just further solidified my feelings about James Duke Courtney and the role of Michael. At number two, we have Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. I have always loved what they did with this movie. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means. It definitely has its issues, whether it's the mask design or the pink mask with the blonde hair. I'm also not a fan of the burn makeup on Loomis. It just looks weird to me. But there's so much to love about the movie as well. Namely, the relationship between Jamie and Rachel. They bring stakes to the movie right up until the very end. Michael also steps up his aggression big time in this one and pulls off one of the craziest feats I have ever seen in my life. He somehow holds on to the bottom of this pickup truck being driven by a bunch of drunk good old boys with guns. He slaughters them all and then even rips the throat out of the guy driving the truck. I mean, it's insane. And at one point, Michael actually stabs the sheriff's daughter with a freaking shotgun. This truly was a back to basics movie, but just amped up, if that makes sense. And honestly, I think it would have been interesting to see where they could have went after the twist ending here. But of course, our final entry is the OG Halloween from 1978. It was never going to be anything else. It didn't even cross my mind and it never will, no matter how good that next sequel is. I already told you this movie is basically the reason I fell in love with the horror genre. I still remember the feeling I got watching this for the first time at maybe uh, six years old. I felt enamored by Michael Myers. I mean, he's the only horror character that I've ever had nightmares about, but that's probably to be expected when you're that young watching it. But there was so much mystery about him. You didn't know who he was or why he was the way that he was. He just stalked and killed babysitters. And he's so meticulous and slow, but it's just terrifying. And he doesn't stop. He may go down for a minute, sure, but he gets right back up and keeps coming. Once he sets his eyes on something, he goes until he gets it. Another thing that's cool, Undertaker himself has confirmed that he got the sit-up from Michael Myers. And that might be my favorite little factoid of all time. And we haven't even touched on the cast and crew yet. This film put Jamie Lee Curtis on the map. It made her the scream queen. Nick Castle as The Shape brought something that has never quite been replicated since, and many have tried. Behind the camera, you have John Carpenter directing and Dean Cundey doing the cinematography. The way they framed the shots and lit the scenes, it's, it's unmatched, in my opinion. And Tommy Lee Wallace, man, the way that you took that Captain Kirk mask and turned it into one of the most recognizable things in horror iconography is just chef's kiss. I understand that came about because of budgetary reasons, but it's just amazing regardless. And all of that is why I think the original Halloween is the best in the entire franchise, and that will never change. But there you have it. That is my ranking of the Halloween franchise. Put your ranking down in the comments below and tell me why you have them in that order. I'm really curious how similar or different our lists may be. 
If you're interested in Redcon One products, I have a discount code that you can use to save 20% off of your entire order. Be sure to check that out. And you can also find all of my merchandise at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Andrew Dreamer or down below this video. And I have been reworking the WWH Patreon page. I've been updating some things on there. So go check that out and consider joining us over there. Or you can join the channel memberships right here on YouTube. All of the links are going to be in the description below. Don't forget to like this video, share the video, and subscribe to the channel so you never miss any of the action here at WWH. Now that we've ranked the entire Halloween franchise, what are the longest running horror franchises? Luckily, you can find out by watching the video that's appearing on your screen now. And remember, in the squared circle of horror, there are no countouts for nightmares. My name is Andrew Dreamer, and this is Wrestling With Horror.